Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Thursday night lecture. Uh, tonight, uh, it is a, uh, an occasion of uh, special significance, 76th anniversary of the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, I'd like to, everyone, to ask everyone to stand, please, and for the posting of the colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. Please be seated. Welcome to tonight's uh, presentation, Pearl Harbor Remembered. We were there. Presented by Pat McClure, a volunteer here at the West Virginia Archives, a graduate of Baldwin Wallace College and holder of a master's degree from Ohio University. Pat taught for two decades at West Virginia State University. She has spent some of her retirement writing about historical subjects, primarily about the veterans on the West Virginia Veterans Memorial. She will be joined tonight by several George Washington High School students in 2017 Advanced Placement U.S. History class, which is taught by Mrs. Kathy Bush. Please welcome Pat McClure and the George Washington High School students and the George Washington High School Junior ROTC drill team led by Sergeant Nolan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. First, I'd like to thank the Junior ROTC at George Washington High School. Um, last week, I invited them to come uh, be in the audience, and I got an immediate response from Sergeant Norman, uh, could the drill team come and uh, actually post the colors, and it seemed like a really good idea at the time. And some of the uh, ROTC students are actually writing bios. I'll tell you more about that later, perhaps. I'd also like to thank the wonderful staff at Archives. They allow me to invade their space anytime I want to come in and work on the, a veterans biography project. And it's something I really like to do, and they act as a sounding board for all my ideas. Uh, we have so much on our agenda that I want to get right into the Pearl Harbor anecdotes. But first, I'd like to give you a little background on the student biography uh, project at George Washington High School. Uh, Mrs. Kathy Bush, Kathy, would you stand? Is the um, <laughs> she teaches the advanced placement history class at George Washington, and we've known each other for several years. And she asked how her students could get in on the writing of biographies, and from then how we have worked on a wonderful collaboration. We are going into our fifth year of doing this, and students have written a number of biographies. Uh, we've had some amazing successes. Uh, students have been asked to write another biography. Students have volunteered to write over the summer after the project was over. Um, one student who is now at Georgetown University came in. He wasn't even part of the project, but he came in the summer after his senior year and wrote a couple bios for us. Our families have asked if some of the students would write other biographies for them. So that, that's just kind of the background of what we have been through. Um, for the 75th anniversary, which was last year, on December 7th, I was asked to write about 
uh, for Golden Seal Magazine asked to write about the West Virginia survivors of Pearl Harbor. And we were only able to find three. And at the end of the program, I'll tell you a little bit about them. But then I began to think about the West Virginia casualties. We all know that West Virginia has uh, provided more than its share of veterans, more than its share of military people. And so how many West Virginians did perish in the attack? Uh, we have identified 27. There may be a few more because some newspapers have said there may be as many as 31, but then they haven't told us exactly who those people are. So we were able to identify 27 for sure, and those are the 27 you'll hear about tonight. Um, I think you'll hear some themes emerging as I ask questions of the students. Uh, we haven't exactly rehearsed this except via email, so it may be a little rough, but some of the themes that I think you may see emerging is that how very young some of these soldiers and sailors were when they went in, uh, how some of them didn't anticipate that they would ever actually see combat. Um, many of them were not, not identified, their remains have not been identified, so they are actually listed on the wall of the missing at the National Cemetery of the Pacific. Um, but listen carefully to what the students have to say because I think they will, will pro provide us some perspective on things that we may not have thought about. Um, one thing I asked them was, what was West Virginia like at the time uh, your person went into the service. And it, it was a very different place now. And therefore, some of these men who went into the service were, thought they were escaping. They may, be, may have been go, uh, from a farm background or they may have been from a coal mining background. And some of them knew that they were enlisting for the Hawaiian department. Hawaii sounded like a paradise if you came from a, a coal mining background. So um, those are some of the things that we might be looking for as we work through with the students. The first person is Howard Adkins. We were trying to write the biographies of all the veterans who perished in Pearl Harbor, but some of them I'm saying are in preparation because we, we didn't quite meet our goal. Um, Howard Lucas Adkins was from Goodwill in Mercer County. He was a Navy man. You'll see there's a, a blending of Navy and, and uh, Army man, and his remains were never found. And if you're here from the current APUSH class, you may end up writing his biography. Chloe didn't want to be first, but she has a veteran <laughs> who was, um, whose name began with A. So here we are. <laughs> okay. So is there something specific that you rem will always remember about your veteran? I'll probably remember um, like he was only 19 when he died. So that was sad. Okay. Um, where was he from? He was from McDowell County, and he was born in 1922. Okay. Did he live anywhere else besides McDowell County? Yes, he moved around a lot. He, from age 13 until he left for service, he lived in Greenbrier County, and it seemed that he was moving like along with coal mining employment. Okay. Um, some students had some difficulty finding information about their individual student. Did you struggle with yours? Greatly. Um, okay. I couldn't find any family members, but I found a lot of like census things and stuff to read. Okay. What, what's the thing you'll most remember about him? Um, probably his bravery and sacrifice. Okay. Thank you, Chloe. Okay, Tristan isn't with us tonight. He didn't volunteer to come, but uh, he wrote a fine biography. And uh, he found that 
Uh, his person was from Logan County, so we can sort of surmise that he might have been a, a coal miner. Um, an interesting thing in one of the newspaper articles that we read about Tillman David Browning was that he had two cousins who immediately after his death enlisted. They were going to avenge his death. Um, Claude Bryant, is, that's another one in prep, so if you're in the current class, you may end up writing that one. He is from Nicholas County. Um, he was in the Army, not the Navy. And he had two brothers who also served in World War II. And that's something we find often, is, is that whole families went. Uh, families were allowed to hold out one son if if uh, there were four in the family, only three had to go, but sometimes that fourth one went anyway. Um, Joseph William Carroll is uh, from Marion County, and he's a Navy man, and he was on the USS Oklahoma. Don't know whether you saw a little blurb in uh, the paper recently, it was either Sunday or Monday, but using DNA, they have uh, been able to identify a hundred of the unknown people. They had the remains, they just didn't know to whom they belonged. And they've been able to identify through DNA a hundred people from the Oklahoma. And I think we're going to find that there were a few others who were on the Oklahoma. We don't know whether the ones that they have recently identified are West Virginians, but that, that should come out soon. Uh, Paul. Paul was, uh, Paul's luck of the draw was he got to write two biographies. He, I think he volunteered to do that, um, but the Casto brothers. Um, tell us something about the Casto brothers' background, Paul. Um, so they actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, they actually weren't born in the same state, even though um, uh, one was born in 1921, and the other was only born one or two years after. Um, Richard was actually born in Ohio. Um, most accounts say that he was born in East Liverpool, and um, Charles Ray was actually born in Pennsylvania. So neither one of them was born in West Virginia? No. Um, neither one was born in West Virginia, but um, by the 1930 census, they had moved to Chester in Hancock County. Okay. And you were able to find out some information about uh, their parents. What did the parents do? Um, the parents actually were both involved in the pottery business. Um, Mary Alice, who was the mother, was actually a ware dresser, and she, uh, uh, a ware dresser is someone who at that time polished clay. Um, and David, uh, David was actually a sagger maker who was the one that actually molded the clay. Okay. Um, what, what do you remember, will you remember most about your veterans? Um, do we have pictures of them? Uh, I think the, the one thing I'll remember the most is that they're both actually very similar. I mean, they both, uh, obviously similar ages, but they both enlisted on the U.S. Oklahoma. And uh, you can kind of infer that they had similar interests as they both became firemen. Um, Richard actually became fireman second class, and uh, Char Charles actually became fireman first class. Okay, Charles was the older of the two, wasn't he? Yes, he was, he was a year to two older. Okay. Um, what will you take away about the era of World War II from having had this assignment? What would I take away? Um, I've, I've, World, World War II specifically has been my favorite topic. Um, but one, one specific story when I was researching the Helmuth for you was about um, an African-American cook named Doris Miller. Um, he had never actually um, uh, b you know, been in battle, never been in combat, but he was always you know, cooking meals for the other other soldiers. Um, and actually when the attack happened, he was on the USS West Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, and the captain, um, after it had been hit, um, uh, I think by it was two torpedoes, the captain actually was hit with shrapnel and he helped carry the captain off. Um, and then actually went back and manned an anti-aircraft gun and it said that he shot down as many as six uh, Japanese aircraft. Okay. And well, we'll get some questions later on. We may have some, since he was on the West Virginia. Okay. 
You'll notice beside Atticus name if you have the handout that there's a little pencil in asterisk which means he's presenting. He decided this week that he was going to do this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the handouts were already made. So uh, he had William Garnett Christian and uh, William Christian can claim be claimed by two states, West Virginia and Tennessee. Would you tell us why? Uh, yes, he was born in McDowell County in West Virginia, but by the 1930 census, he had moved to Harriman, Tennessee. Um, so he, by the time he was four years old, he'd already emigrated from the state. Okay. Uh, do you know anything about his, his background since he did move away from here? Um, I'm aware that he was from a rather poor family, and he was likely sent off to Tennessee to live with um, wealthier family members and to take advantage of some of the um, some of the reconstructed programs that Franklin Roosevelt had put into place by 1936. For example, the Tennessee Valley Authority. The place in Tennessee that he moved to was very close to the epicenter of the Tennessee Valley, so there was a bit more economic opportunity in the area. Um, did you experience any frustration in finding information about your guy since he did move out of state? Uh, I was fortunate to find some information on him uh, in, a, in a website that had written biographies about many sailors aboard the USS West Virginia, which was uh, the boat that he was stationed on. But um, I was not able to get a hold of any family members. I, I identified one brother who seemed to be living at the time, but I could not get, I could not get a hold of him. Okay. It's kind of ironic, isn't it, that he was from West Virginia originally, and he mm -hmm. was on the West Virginia. From West Virginia, moved to Tennessee, and then actually moved to California before he, um, he enlisted in 1936, and then moved to California by 1940, and then he was stationed at Pearl Harbor aboard the USS West Virginia, so it kind of came full circle for him. Okay, Th this is another sad case because he had a, he was married and had a child, and um, we weren't able to, to locate the child. No, we no. Okay. okay, thank you, Atticus. Right. Thank you. Okay, um, Stanislaw, and I can't pronounce the last name. He comes from one of those countries where they have an excess of consonants. Uh, Stanislaw Drawal um, is obviously of Polish extraction, and we will write his biography this year. Though, those that say that the biographies are in prep, they will get done within the next year. Um, his family was, uh, he graduated from Thomas High School and it was a, definitely a coal mining family as many Polish, of our Polish immigrants in West Virginia were. And he was on the USS Oklahoma, but his brother Walter also enlisted in the Navy and he died in the European theater. So this family uh, really, like, like the family that Paul told you about, uh, that they really had a, a double case of sadness. Okay. Our biographer, Harold Clyde Elliard, is a man named Leon Armantrout. Uh, I asked Leon if he would write some biographies of the Pearl Harbor people for us uh, because he, he is a man who lives in Florida, but he's been extremely interested in the biography project. And so much so that he's written all the World War I biographies for two counties in West Virginia. But I said, would you do some uh, Pearl Harbor biographies? And he said yes, and he did Harold Elliard's. And Harold was married. He had a son. He was an Army guy, so he was stationed at Hickam Field. Um, he was actually in the Army Air Corps. It wasn't called the Air Force at the time, it was the Army Air Corps. And he, uh, because he was on land, um, his remains were recovered and he's buried at the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific. The National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific is where most of these people would be buried unless their families were able to bring them home. It has some other names too. Um, it's, it's sometimes called the punch bowl because it's, it's built into, into or around the crater of a volcano. And you may see that term several times. Uh, Robert Lee Hull is another one that's in prep. He was in the Army. Uh, he's a native of Wheeling. Um, 
He was first buried in the National Memorial Cemetery, but when families were able to bring the remains back, they brought him back to Greenwood Cemetery. Uh, Leon wrote another one, but I think he really started the project for us. Uh, he wrote Robert Paul Lauterach's uh, biography. Um, Lauterach was one of six children. He was in the Navy. He was on the Arizona, and uh, he was posthumously awarded five medals, and there is a bridge uh, on US 250 near Beverly in, in Randolph County uh, that's named in his honor. Uh, we, classes previous to this one have written a lot about the, the people uh, who have bridges named for them. And so when you're on the highway and you see uh, a bridge that's named for somebody, chances are there may be a biography or an upcoming biography of uh, people who have bridges named for them. Uh, Donald Robert McLeod uh, was on the Oklahoma. And uh, that, it's my fault that that biography is not up because that's one I assigned to myself. Um, there's an interesting story told by the Triolo brothers of Logan County who, who said that they had a bet with him the night before he died and they were never able to reclaim their property. Uh, here's another one written by Leon Armentrout. Clarence William McComas was born in Kentucky uh, his father served in World War I, which of course would have caught Leon Armentrout's uh, eye because he's so interested in World War I. Clarence McComas was not quite 16 years old uh, when he enlisted. Think of it. The kids who are here tonight, the students who are, I'm sorry, the students who are here tonight are older than he was at the time he enlisted. And he was on the West Virginia as well. Uh, George Vincent McGraw was a little older. He would have been 25 when he died. Uh, he was working in the coal mines. He was on the USS California at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And he is memorialized on the tablets of the missing. I haven't been there, but it's, my, it's on my bucket list to go to Pearl Harbor. And it's my understanding that there are, at the cemetery, there are panels which are called the courts of the missing, and then on the, on the panels are inscribed the names, are engraved the names, much like our, our memorial out here. John. Um, what, what will you take about what will you always remember about the veteran you wrote about? Um, I think it's really interesting how he had eight brothers and sisters, two of which served in the military. Uh, his brother Tom was actually a really decorated soldier who fought in the Battle of the Bulge and got a Bronze Star. He also had a brother named Elias um, who fought in the army, but not as much as known about him. Um, so yeah, I just, I just like when I was researching him, I actually talked to his brother Charles. Um, he grew up in kind of like a like split household where his his father, or the father figure in the house, wasn't actually related to him. Um, but he, like his mother, I guess, uh, had his had him and his brother Tom, and then either his dad, his biological dad, died, or who knows. But um, so he and his brother are the only two nickels in the family, and the rest are all Blackburns. So I talked to his youngest brother Charles, um, who was like probably two or three at the time, and uh, he he really didn't know much about uh, Carl. It seems like. Um, more of the family's attention went more towards Tom. Okay. Um, some of the students experienced frustration in finding the research materials they needed for this project. Did you have that? Uh, yeah. Really, the only resource I had was Charles. And uh, he had a VFW post in, I think it was Marion County. I don't know why it wasn't in um, Mingo County, where he's from. But, uh, um, yeah, so like there wasn't as much on him, and like I said, uh, his brother Charles didn't really know much about him. Okay, by focusing on an individual, you were supposed to learn something about the World War II era. What did, what will you take through life with you about that era? Um, well, during that period, Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt was president, so some of his New, New Deal pro programs, such as the CCC, uh, 
Charles or Carl was a part of that, so I thought that was interesting how uh, he went around the state conserving uh, the natural beauty. Okay. Thank you, John. Uh, Lydia. What can you tell us about your veteran's background? Okay, um, he was born in Logan County and then later moved to Charleston. Um, and in the beginning of his life, his family most likely uh, had some economic prosperity, but then by the time they moved to Charleston, they were definitely feeling the effects of the Great Depression. Um, he had three siblings, Willa, Frank, and, um, well, Robert, Eleanor, and Maurice, and was born to Willa and Frank. Okay. Lydia brought up a good point, and that is that many of these families were just emerging from the Great Depression at the time uh, their sons enlisted in the military, and so that might have been a reason for, and you know, many, probably a lot of World War II people were drafted, but for those who enlisted, the, the Great Depression was still hanging over their heads. Especially West Virginia didn't emerge from the Great Depression in quite the same way that other states did. So that was, that's a good point. Um, did you have some frustration in, in uh, finding research materials? Yes, um, it wasn't that hard to find family members, but um, there were no um, living family members and there wasn't any other information about him or uh, his life. Okay. She's also in a unique position to um, talk about another aspect, and that is that Lydia's in uh, junior ROTC, and they are writing some biographies this year. Are you coming at it from a di the biography this year um, from a different perspective than you did in APUSH? Yeah, um, I was a lot more excited to write this one. Um, uh, it's This one is um, from the Beirut bombing, so uh, he did have a family member living, and it was nice to get to talk to them and actually know personal information about them. Who are you researching from the Beirut bombing? Uh, Mika Kamara. Oh, are you? Oh, great, great. Okay, thanks. <laughs> DJ. Okay. DJ is also in a unique position in that he was not only had a family member who was a, a contact person, but that family member was had a great deal to offer. Um, how did that affect your the research process for you? Uh, I think having a family member alive made it a lot more personal for me. So this was a project that I felt like I was really having an impact on somebody. So whenever I first was able to make contact with the family member, he was very excited that you know someone was really taking interest. And in, because at the time when we were writing these biographies, no one had published biographies before and there really wasn't any information about these veterans so then their family members that you know were we were able to make contact with to be able to see you know that people still you know cared and were, were we were writing these projects I think really helped him and then he had so much information to give me and he had on his own done a little bit of research and was able to, to give that to me and it really gave me a place to start and then I was able to elaborate on the information he gave me. And when we're talking about a family member, he actually was in contact with a nephew. It was a nephew, of, yeah. yeah. He was from a nephew of Robert from Florida. So from we Florida. were able to have you know phone conversations and emails, and had a really good two or three months where we had, we would talk and um, exchange information. And you know, I would send him some of the, the updates on my project. He would critique, send additional things. He would talk to find photos and anything he had. He was able to to send to me as well. Yeah, email has been a wonderful asset to us to be able, we wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for email because yeah. so much of the correspondence between the students and me and the students and the family members and so forth takes place via email. Um, did you learn anything about West Virginia in, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, just learning kind of what life was like for, for someone growing up, you know, and, and comparing that to maybe how it was different from what I experienced. Um, he played baseball and football, so there was a similarity there for, um, for Wellsburg High School. He attended West Virginia University. So just um, seeing what West Virginia was like, his family was, um, he was part of a pretty large family. He was um, one of six children. He was also a twin, which was kind of unique about him. So seeing how his family grew up in Wellsburg, his dad was an engineer. 
um, and during the 1920s and 30s. He also worked on the CCC, so he's part of some of the New Deal programs trying to put people back to work after the um, Great Depression. Yeah, and the interesting thing about uh, Ritchie is that it seems like his family was in, in better economic circumstances than most of the families that we are talking about. But at the same time, uh, Robert was a twin, and his twin brother didn't. Yeah. They, they had to choose which one was going to go to college, and Robert drew the longer straw, I guess. Yeah, so he, uh, Robert was actually the one that was chosen to go to college because his dad could only afford to send one of them to college. Um, they ended up, both of them ended up serving in, in the Army, and Robert did participate. He graduated from West Virginia, and he was in the ROTC program there for four years. Okay. Thank you, DJ. All right. Thank you. What can you tell us about your veteran's background? What did you, were you able to find out? Well, there wasn't a lot to find because he um, moved around a lot. I think it was because he was poor and his dad had uh, trouble finding jobs because originally in the 1930s census, his father was a clerk in a grocery store. And then later in 1940, he was listed as a carpenter. So um, that was probably why he chose to like enlist to get out of like a poor situation and he had one younger brother who was a year younger, so. Okay. Um, some of the students experienced some frustration in the research process. Was that something that you, did you have some difficulty finding things out about him? Well, definitely because um, there was no like living relatives. And um, as I said, his, he seemed to like move around a lot around uh, West Virginia. So there wasn't really any like set in stone information about him, except for like census records. Okay. Um, is there something that you will carry with you kind of in the back of your mind the rest of your life about having researched this veteran? I mean, it kind of brings into like perspective how poor and like the idea that risking your life was better like as an escape and how that must have been to be like 18 years old and thinking that that was like a good way to get out and how it must have been for them in contrast to how it is for us now and how many choices we have, so. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Maggie. What can you tell us about your veteran's background? What were you able to find? Well, he grew up in Anstead, West Virginia, which was in Fayette County. Um, and that was, I mean, it has historically been a coal town. So his father was a coal miner, and presumably his father was a coal miner, and so on. Um, his mother was a full-time mom, and he had two siblings. Um, I couldn't find a lot of background information on him. Um, there wasn't a lot available. Most of the information I collected was through census records. Um, he was a signalman first class aboard the USS Oklahoma, and um, he, based on you know his upbringing and the fact that it was you know deeply a coal town and there wasn't very much to do other than you know mine coal, um, it it's very likely that you know enlisting in the military could be seen as an escape. Um, I couldn't find any family members. Um, that would respond to me. I mean, I, I messaged a couple prospective family members, but I didn't get a response. Um, so, yeah, I, he moved from West Virginia. He grew up in Anstead, and then he moved to Norfolk after enlisting in the military. Um, then he moved to LA, which I mean, I can imagine from Anstead, West Virginia, to Los Angeles. Like you probably, you know, that's that's a big, that's a big jump. But um, from LA, where he married his wife. Um, he moved to, that's when he was deployed to Pearl Harbor. Um, but. Okay, you, I think you, when you emailed me, you said you could use where he came from as a way to understand him. Have you kind of answered that question or? I, uh, somewhat, uh, just because of the lack of information that I could really find on him. Um, but I mean, based on, on what Anset was like, yeah, you can imagine, you know, sort of what his upbringing was like. Okay. Notice, folks, that he was on the Oklahoma and that he is on the tablets of the missing, but he might be one of those 100 that they have recently identified with DNA. So it would be, it's going to be kind of interesting to look 
for that, isn't it? Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. Grace. Okay, what do we know about Morris Stacy? What, what, what do you know about him that you might carry with you throughout life? What, some, was there something about him that impressed you? Um, I actually found out from a news clipping that um, whenever the planes first hit um, Hickam Field, or Wheeler Field, which is where he was stationed, um, him and a pilot tried to get a plane out and ended up being strafed by aircraft fire. But it was just like so brave and heroic because um, he had been sending letters to his family and was like, I'm probably not going to be home for Christmas this year. And he knew that the, an attack was pretty much uh, likely. So it was pretty interesting to read all that. It was very enlightening. OK. Um, what will you remember about the World War II era from having researched this? Um, mostly person? just that um, in West Virginia, I mean, most families were working class families. There are families that were coal miners or like um, Morris's family, uh, farmers, they're really impoverished. I mean, West Virginia was hit really hard by the Depression, and uh, his family was very poor. Okay. Um, is there a, maybe I asked you this before, what will you most remember about him? Um, just his, his heroism. Um, he was very willing to do his job and be there for his um, fellow soldiers, especially on that day. Okay. Notice, folks, that as I was looking back through his, his information, I saw that on June 6, 1944, does that date ring a bell to anybody? D-Day. That's D-Day. And at that time, his brother was listed as MIA. However, he's not He's not listed as a West Virginia casualty, so apparently he was eventually found. Thank you. Um, Carrie Kenneth Stockwell, we were able to locate a family member at the uh, very end of the process, and that's how we were able to get a photo of him. Um, it, but it was a very difficult process to finally find a family member, and I believe that was a great niece. Um, he was from Clay County, uh, specifically Ivydale. He was at Hickam Field, and, but he, his remains were, uh, at, were brought back to Clay County in 1947. It was, I think, about 1947 before anybody's remains were, were brought back. <coughs> Um, this is an interesting one to me because um, Randall Thomas was from Cowan in Webster County and my office mate at West Virginia State was from Webster County and I emailed her and said, do you know anything about Randall James Thomas? Well, obviously she's, she was about a generation younger than Randall James Thomas, but she told me some stories about his mother. But the, the thing that particularly was of interest to me was that um, in the newspaper at the time of his death, his high school principal wrote a poem in his honor. Now, how many of us would our high school pr principals write a poem about us? Not mine. <laughs> so he obviously had a very, uh, very great impact on the people he was around. Everybody said he was, he was a great guy. I mean, there were numerous tributes to him in the Webster County newspaper at that time. And he was on the Arizona, the, Ill, the terribly ill-fated Arizona. Um, we don't know the exact date of Russell Vitalov's uh, birth, so, but we think he was born about 1920, so he would have been about 21. He was from Fayette County, but the fa like, like you've heard from other people, the family moved around a lot. Uh, he had two brothers, and then he, his mother remarried and he had two stepbrothers. Uh, that, that made finding information about him difficult because her name changed from census to census. Uh, he was employed in the mines 
uh, because he was one of the older of our veterans. Um, he specifically enlisted for the Hawaiian Department, and he was, but he was at Hickam Field at the time of the attack. You can, some of these photos aren't very good because they're taken from newspaper photos at the time, um, but at least we have something. Um, Clyde Richard w Wilson is um, from Marion County. He was on the West Virginia. He is uh, memorialized at the National Cemetery of the Pacific on the walls of the missing. And there's also a bridge named for him in his honor. Um, the person who researched him found that he is, uh, Clyde Richard Wilson's mother's maiden name was Tennant, and he is a relative of our former Secretary of State, Natalie Tennant. Um, Bernard Raymond Wimmer is one that is, is in prep. He was on the USS Oklahoma, and so again, it's possible that his, ident um, his identity, his remains may be identified in, in the future. And Thomas Mon Monroe Wright is one that I wrote. Uh, that's where I found out the term pineapple soldier, um, that the men really wanted to go to Hawaii. So if they could possibly uh, enlist for the Hawaiian department, they did. And he's actually buried. He, um, he was at Hickam Field, so his remains were recovered, and he, he is actually buried at the National Cemetery of the Pacific. Um, I'm going to skip over that. We, there may be a few others that we have not been able to identify. We've been able to identify 27. and. Um, there, there may be as many as four others, but I don't know their names at the, this time. Many of the West Virginians who went did, of course, come back. When they came back, they lived normal lives, they raised families, they led very, led very produ productive lives. Uh, two years ago, when I began searching for West Virginia survivors of the Pearl Harbor attack, I was able to identify three. And since then, uh, one more has come, we found out about him. Uh, I'd like to tell you something about that because this has been a, a wonderful experience for me to identify these over 90 year old men who have such great stories to tell. The first one, uh, I can tell you right now that Wetzel Sanders is alive and well because I saw him at noon today. He was at the ceremony at the Lee Street Triangle. Now that's an early picture of him. He doesn't look like that now, but he is an incredible man. To be 94 years old, he's a widow, widower, he takes care of his own home, does his own laundry, cooks his own meals, grows a garden, goes out on the mountain where he lives uh, on a four-wheeler and cuts down brush and uh, gives away, he gives away firewood to people who need it. He's always looking for, uh, looking for ways to help people. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, he, he, he spent his life looking out for other people. Um, last year, he, d he couldn't come to any Pearl Harbor ceremonies in West Virginia because he was at Pearl Harbor participating in the ceremonies over there. And he says that he's going to go back for the 80th anniversary. And he says he's going to go back for the 85th anniversary because he'll only be 103 at that, at that time. Um, so, and oh, he just got a Purple Heart uh, this year. He waited uh, 76 years to get his Purple Heart. He heard about somebody who had waited 22 years for a Purple Heart, and he said, heck, I waited 76 years for mine. He called me one day last spring and told me, I just bought myself a new truck. <laughs> if you're 94 years old, do you need a new truck? He had a perfectly good, wonderful truck, but he had, 
that's how forward-looking he is. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about him when I tell you about the next person. Uh, the man on your left is Henry Sloan. Uh, Henry was a pineapple soldier, and not only was he a survivor of Pearl Harbor, but when I went to visit him in Greenbrier County, he could tell me island by island where he was after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, in early 1942, or perhaps around the summer, what would be summer to us, in 1942, his unit uh, went to Australia. Well, their seasons are reversed, so they didn't have the clothing they needed to stay warm in Australia, so that was one of the things he described for me. But he could tell me island by island, and there was only one island that he couldn't name, and he said, I think it starts with a G. Well, I hadn't really done the proper research uh, before I interviewed him, so I came back and I looked up his unit, and by golly, he had named every, every place he had been, and it perfect memory. Unfortunately, Mr. Sloan is, um, you can see now he's about 96 years old, and he's, he's somewhat frail. Well, last Christmas Eve, Wetzel Sanders called me on the phone and said, um, you know that feller from up in Greenbrier County? Uh, and, he, and Henry does still live in Greenbrier County. He said, he's over at CAMC in the heart unit. And so the next day I went over, uh, Christmas Day, I went over at, at noon and um, I said, Mr. Sloan, do you know who I am? And he did. And uh, I said, did Mr. Sanders come to see you? And he said, yes, he did. He came and had lunch with me on Christmas Day. Looking out, Mr. Sanders, always looking out for other people. The interesting thing, they didn't know each other until I started the investigation of Pearl Harbor survivors. But they have kind of formed a fraternity of two. Um, we're, we're the only ones left, and, and they, they really have become buddies. And Mr. Sanders says, I'm going over to see him again. I want to do it before the weather gets bad. Um, this person did not want to be identified in the Gold Seal article. He's led a very public life. Um, he came home, raised a family, was active in his church, went to Pearl Harbor celebrations in his hometown year after year. Uh, he, he's the only one of the four survivors who was a Navy man, and he was on the USS Maryland. Um, but we can understand why somebody in their 90s would want that kind of privacy. So I felt like we had to pay tribute to him, but I'm not naming him by name. And just this year, um, right after Veterans Day, uh, in the Charleston newspaper, there was an article about this man named Bill Winters who lives in Mason County. And uh, he was in the Army Air Corps. The, uh, the article was written by Douglas Imbrogno, and he's a meticulous researcher. So we, we can be satisfied that Mr. Winters is a bona fide Pearl Harbor survivor. But I didn't know about him at the time I was writing for Golden Seal. Um, Mr. Winters returned to have a career at DuPont. He was there for 38 years, and he had three sons, all of whom went into the military. Um, that's basically what we know about West Virginians who were, were at Pearl Harbor. Uh, I entitled the program at um, Pearl Harbor Remembered. We were there. When I say we, I mean I'm using the we in a collective sense. West Virginia was at Pearl Harbor and more than amply played its part. And so please say thank you to these students that, that did the wonderful research and work. Um, we, we will open the floor to questions. I prefer that you direct the questions to the students. Does anybody have questions? I have a question. 
So how many of you have been able, uh, how many of you have been able to actually uh, talk with any relatives of these uh, service members that you've actually uh, met or do you, did you work on? A couple of you actually uh, did talk to you said you were in email conversation. And, and like I say, it's sometimes it's nice to really reflect on that past and actually learn about their lives and you know, heritage back. It's great. Lydia, didn't you say you were, and, and she was talk, referring to a biography she's writing of a casualty of the Beirut bombing in 83, but didn't you say you had? Yeah, um, with his sister, um, it was actually uh, really interesting because um, it was such like, they were very close, and it was actually to get like a very personal perspective on um, a person that you're writing about. Other questions? I have a question. As you're going through and you're noticing the Navy veterans, or the Navy, uh, the guys that were in the Navy, when you were looking at their descriptions of what they were, did, did you did you look back to see what their jobs were? And I'm asking that for a reason. But, uh, uh, yeah, my, the veteran that I wrote about, William Garnet Christian, was a Baker first class, and uh, he did exactly as you, would, as you would think a Baker first class would do. He worked in the kitchens of the USS West Virginia. Um, my veteran was actually in the, in the Air Force or the Air Corps, and he um, was flying on the B-17 bombers. So I actually went in and did some additional research on those planes, and it was really cool to see the role that they played and, and his role as um, working on the, the bomb squadron. Um, my guy was in the Navy, and he was a, he was a pharmacist mate, third class, and. Uh, even though he was just 18, he actually helped on uh, like minor surgeries and stuff like that. That's the one in particular that I had a comment on. Uh, the pharmacist, pharmacist mate, uh, eventually, as the job evolved a little bit, are now known as hospital coordinator. And that's, that's one of the fields within the Navy. It covers a lot of different things, uh, x-ray techs, uh, all the way down to like the paramedic. And, and was there any other? Other questions? Some of you who are students and you have an assignment coming up, do you have any One story that I, I wouldn't want to, uh, I don't think this event would be complete without, is uh, the story of how the USS West Virginia came back into combat. So it was, it was sunk, it was moored right next to the USS Arizona at the time of the attack and it was sunk by two torpedoes on its port side and it sunk sideways so that it was completely embedded in the mud. It burned for 30 days. Um, but salvaging operations began shortly after. And uh, on May 5th, I think, uh, 1942, so the following year, it was, um, it was brought up out of the water and it was, um, repair work was done on it. And by 1944, it, had, it was uh, back with the Pacific Fleet and uh, commanded by Generals Nimitz and MacArthur. It, supported the amphibious invasion of uh, Iwo Jima and actually fought in the battle of, um, is it Late Gulf? Late, how do you pronounce it? Lady, Lady Gulf, uh, which was the largest naval battle of, of World War II. So it was sunk in 1941 and it came back in 1944 to basically close out the war. So USS Virginia, pretty cool. Or West Virginia, pretty cool. Okay, I have one more question, and we're about ready to wind up here. I have one more question. Did any of you find, and I won't ask you to divulge, but did any of you find information about your veteran or your veteran's family that you thought, maybe I shouldn't put that in the biography? Um, yeah, my veteran, like, <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was a uh, like a bar near his house, and it was about, uh, my family member was talking about how he liked to go and have a good time with his, his with his twin. At, they would sing and dance and have a good time at his bar. Okay, well that uh, okay. <laughs> that, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> that no, uh, I just wondered. So there have been times when I have been researching a veteran, and a family member has told me things, and then then say. Oh, but we don't want that in the, in the Bible. Well, we're not, we're not here. It's not, um, 
you know, a, a tabloid newspaper. It, we are really here to honor veterans. So sometimes we do kind of censor things out. I've had to do that a few times. But I wondered if you had ex experienced that. Um, and it, it, you, you want to tell the truth, but there are some things that you may not want to post online. Okay, uh, that concludes our program. Oh, we have I, I just want to make an anecdotal comment about the Casto brothers. Uh, I grew up in Hancock County, and I don't remember which one of you said you did, but you seem to be a little bit like they one up. He was born in East Liverpool, and one was born in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. East Liverpool is right across the river. Matter of right. fact, I'm one of five children. Three of my siblings were born in East Liverpool, it's, and it wasn't uncommon. For, and some of my friends were born in Pennsylvania. I mean, you just went across the border. It's not, the county is only 88 square miles, and it's you know it, it's only five, four miles wide at its widest point. So there's nothing unusual about being, living, being born in East Liverpool on the one side or over in Pennsylvania on the other side. That, that's a really good point. A couple years ago, a class, it seemed to have a preponderance of people who were born up in that northern panhandle. Well, the families there, you know, were moving from Pittsburgh to Wheeling and Wheeling well, to moving. Steubenville. You weren't moving. There was no hospital. The only hospital was in East Liverpool. Oh, okay. fact, the only hospital was still in East Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> there was no hospital in Chester or Newell. So you either went to, if you, if you were in the northern part of Hancock County, you were born and over in East Liverpool. Okay. I was in a sort of the central part of the county. Three of my siblings, like I said, were born there. One of me and one other sibling were born down in Weirton, West Virginia. So there's nothing unusual about the fact that these people were born. The same way if there were some of those ones you found in Brook County or in, in Ohio County or Marshall County, they'd be, there would be nothing unusual being born across the river in Ohio or, or, or in Pennsylvania. That, that's a really good point, and it, those of you who are going to be working on biographies this year, if you, you come up with a, a person who is from that northern panhandle, it's something to think about. Uh, the VFW at um, Newell was named for the Casto brothers. In, but in Chester. Castle. In Chester. But yeah, and they don't, they, I was telling him, <laughs> my dad was telling me, he lives in Chester, uh, and, and they don't, in light of what's happened in the NFL, they don't show NFL football games at the Casto VFW or at the American Legion in Chester anymore. Really? <laughs> they, they don't go in for that kneeling uh, okay. <laughs> where I came from. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, hand to all the students. And have a good Uh, please stand for the posting of the colors. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, next year we'll be having some more lectures, so please uh, tune in to our website and you'll see them posted there. Thank you very much again. <laughs>